So this is um, a very long-term project that actually has, is really coming to life these days. And uh, please check it out at our booth. But um, this concept of the augmented conversation is not a, a new idea. Uh, in fact, um, I love this quote, study the past if you would divine the future. Not many people do that, and not many people understand why that's important. This uh, came from Confucius, which was a long time ago. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a bit of a history lesson about where things were, and in a sense, uh, how things got a little bit derailed in, in our attempt to put it back on track. So where it started was here. Doug Engelbart is, uh, I think, probably the most single most important computer scientist in our very brief history of computer science. Um, uh, his vision of the way things should work was exactly spot on. And the terrible thing was that we lost uh, a lot of those ideas. But this is important. This is probably the most important quote key thing about all the world's big problems is they have to be dealt with collectively. If we don't get collectively smarter, we're doomed. I think you all understand the impact and meaning of that. Doug's known as the inventor of the mouse, uh, but that was like the guy who invented the car and giving him credit for the radio. Uh, that was a part of a full system. Uh, he wanted to understand and construct a system that uh, enabled humans to not just interact with co computers, but use those computers with, to interact with other humans, a communication capability. And the goal was to utilize that, that communication to be able to understand and, very, and solve very hard problems. So the computer, the computer infrastructure, was required to create a shared intellectual place for argument, an argument not in a negative sense. The idea of exploring ideas is really what argument means. Um, this is and so um, this special thing, if I label 13, will switch. switch. Actually, I want to back up just a bit. Uh, this is a demo that Doug made, uh, did in 1968. And uh, this is the thing that changed the world. It's probably the most important demonstration ever done. And this particular segment is where he illustrates the real power of this system. So I'm going to keep going. And watch this really carefully, because it's just astonishing. It's 1968. Everything you're seeing here, which you probably take for granted, was, had never been seen before. And so this special thing, if I label 13, will switch, switch over. So on his display, he sees my text. So I'll execute it. And sure enough, it does. But what's that running around? Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting there in Menlo Park looking at this text, and he can point to it. But we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this. So my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. So, all right. So uh, in case you haven't been listening, Bill, <laughs> we've been going through lots of examples. And setting up in collaboration here so that we can go on into information retrieval. And we've set up now audio coupling, and we're both looking at the same display. And that'd be very handy to work. We can talk to each other and point. And maybe later I could hand you the chalk on this blackboard, like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. So before I can do that, I'd have to set up my display in a certain way. Set it up so it, I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there. And I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it. And I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. 50 years ago. And they're actually doing something more powerful than you are when you're using Zoom. 
So look at this picture. Uh, that's Doug and his team. And why this is interesting is they were using the computer in the meetings, not so that they could see each other, but to actually use the computer to augment their ability to explore ideas together. He had this idea he called collective IQ as a measure of how well people can work together on important challenges, uh, ultimately a measure of a group's effectiveness. Uh, again, this is one of those ideas that seems to have gotten lost in the midst of time, but the reality is this is the, the opportunity that still is in front of us. One of his big ideas was this concept of bootstrapping, where the state of technology uh, amplifies our ability to manipulate information, which then amplifies the capabilities, the technologies that we can create with it. This is a spiral coming out of the screen, where we use, utilizing the technologies, we can improve uh, the systems cons constantly. That was uh, embraced by this man. Uh, Alan um, is, you probably know that he, he was my mentor. I've been working with him for about 30 years, but this quote is my favorite. It doesn't have anything to do with anything else, but man is much more than a tool builder. He's an inventor of universes. That's more true than today than ever. Uh, but this is how he thought about computing. It's not about writing and press made possible a very different kind of travel through space and time, but a new manner of traveling through ideas was a consequence of what it meant to learn to read and write fluently, uh, a language. Um, this picture was also done in 1968. Alan had met with Seymour Papert, uh, the creator of Logo, and also he knew very well the work that Doug had been doing. He had visited him many times. This picture is a number of things going on. First of all, his concept of a Dynabook was basically a tablet computer if you look at those screens there, you'll notice it's the same thing. These two children are collaborating. In this case, they're playing a game together. But then they switch modes and actually modify the program of that, of that game collaboratively. It's a uh, wonderful vision of the future that, obviously, we haven't quite achieved yet. But it, it, the inspiration of that uh, by the way, there's a, a 3D model that Alan created out of cardboard. He put shot in it to see what the, the weight should be. It turned out that it was two pounds. It turned out that was the weight of the first iPad. Is used to select and this, information. We, I wanna, this is the system that resulted from that concept of the Dynabook. This is small talk, 1978, which is a really important year. Uh, but what you're going to see here, 1978, is an environment, an experience, a, a system that actually, first of all, you can see it's, it's the direct ancestor of your phone and your PC. But the other side of it is if I sat you down in front of it, you'd already know how to use it because that's what you've been using. Uh, and the other thing is it's, it was actually more powerful than your PC. I'm going to show you why is used to select information. A window is selected by moving the cursor inside of it and pressing the first mouse button. A selected window displays above other windows, much like placing a piece of paper on top of a stack on a desk. Information in the window can be selected using this first mouse button. The selected information can be changed. Here, selected text is displayed as white characters on a black background. The selected text is replaced by typing on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So, boring. But can you imagine if you'd never seen that before and you saw it for the first time? And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a network computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by 
the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. And they do, almost. Not quite, because, as I said, he missed some big picture items. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about a bit. These two gentlemen understood that computer is a medium, but in more important, it, it's a live medium. And now we're here. The metaverse is a live communication medium. Uh, I mean, and I, I want to take slightly different fork for just a bit to give you some perspective. Language, when we think about language, language is a virtual machine running on the top of your brain. Uh, you, know, you think of your brain as the hardware. Language, you think in terms of language. It allows you to understand and communicate ideas. Uh, and, and, and so really, language in, is a thing that kind of defines you. You think in terms of language, and it's not, not just speech. Music's a language. Any musician will tell you that. We're communicating a different kind of idea to people, thoughts, feelings. Anybody who's a musician understands that there's a different way of expressing yourself in that delivery. But mathematics is also a language. It allows us to understand and control the world. Uh, but again, it's a virtual machine running on your brain. You learn that language, and then you use that language. You think in those terms so you can achieve magical things. Um, so the metaverse, whatever that means to me, it means extremely powerful and rich language that enables this augmented conversation uh, where the ideas we express are amplified and made real by the computer. This is Doug Engelbart's vision. This is not mine. This is the way things were supposed to be. You're defined more than anything by how you communicate. The metaverse is going to redefine what it means to be human. Maybe we become meta-human, but we are going to be very different when this, uh, this technology takes hold. How's it going to happen? I'm going to talk about quickly what my vision, my, my concept of what the augmented conversation is. Uh, it's the primary factor in how the, our interfaces evolved was this idea of an augmented conversation. What Doug and Alan had in mind was using the computer as a full partner in this conversation. What meant, went missing was, and it got lost as soon as it left Doug's lab, was the other humans. So augmented conversation is going to allow us to jointly invent and explore new universes, like Alan said. And here's the features. One, a discussion within a group of users that's extraordinarily enhanced with the kinds of tools and capabilities that are only available with a computer. Remember Doug's team are sitting around a table using the computer to expand their, the scope of their conversation and their argument. It's a computer AI. Uh, full participant in that conversation. Uh, imagine you'd say something, a computer generates that simulation, the other person can then modify that, interact with it as easily and naturally as we talk about the weather. There's got to be a guarantee of shared truth. Any communication has to be, I say something and you understand what I'm saying. I do something, you see me do it as I do it. Uh, if, if in fact, what happens is you're not getting that signal clear, clearly, then you're not going to trust it. Uh, shared system has to enable bit identical modification, extension of that system dynamically while it's running. This is the magic thing about what Alan and his team did at Xerox was they built a system on the Alto. Actually, I want to talk about that. I'm going to get back to that. So, 
we built a system, Croquet, augment, which the, the, the idea is augmented conversation requires a new kind of operating system. Really, think about this ability to communicate and collaborate, which permeates everything. That can't be something that's a veneer on top. It has to be a foundational thing, particularly when you start thinking of the security required for that. So even the programming and debugging have to be fully collaborative interaction between users. The Xerox Alto, that was the system. This is, con they, they referred to this as the interim Dynabook. And the entire software stack could be modified in the system while the system was running. Imagine here's an OS and we're going to modify the OS. Uh, and, and so there's a symbiosis between the human engineer, the developer, the person touching it, and the computer system itself. A uh, programmer thinks about something, a machine enables it. And by the way, uh, when Steve Jobs went to see that demo at Xerox Park, uh, Dan Engels gave him the demo, and Steve was complaining about how the code, would, code browser was scrolling at one line at a time. He said it should be smooth. So uh, Dan opened up the code browser, modified, he actually removed a line of code, and now it moves sm smoothly. It was such a natural act that Steve Jobs did not notice that but he modified the entire system right in front of him. It was one of those things that great user interfaces are invisible. So here we are building interfaces for the metaverse, and it's like, this is an important thing. We're building a ship in a bottle, we throw it out in the ocean and expect it to float. It isn't gonna happen. Um, this idea of bootstrapping that Doug talked about, the metaverse must be a platform where we can create even better systems from within it. Uh, we have to design a collaborative interface, but we have to do that collaboratively. Um, so this Croquet project that we've been working on that we, that we have now made available on the web, we consider that to be a, a missing protocol of the internet in a lot of ways, because it goes back to the original vision of what computing should be, and we, we are working on making that a reality. And it's a question, who did this? This was the team that did the initial version. That's me, uh, Alan uh, Kay. David Reed is a, a key element. David was the architect of UDP and co-architect of TCP IP and also formulated Reed's Law, if you're familiar with that, which is the growth of the internet via groups. And Andreas Rob is probably one of the best programmers that ever lived. So we actually cracked that code, but unfortunately we did it in Smalltalk, which was great because Smalltalk's a language that allows us to express these things. But this is actually how the system works. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically, it's a model view architecture. User interacts with the view, which you see. Message gets sent up to our reflector that has no application state. That message gets a timestamp sent to a virtual computer, does the compute. Uh, so the compute is actually on the client side, which means latency is very, very low. This is an example of croquet running. And I'm gonna get, I'll, I'll talk through this real quick. So this is um, uh, two users. I'm going to synchronize them right now. And everything you see is perfectly synchronized. So I grab hold of that on one machine. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, you'd see the same thing. Uh, this is an example of a multiplayer asteroids game that we built. Again, everything's perfectly synchronized. Um, over here is uh, a, a simple text editor, but what's neat is this is not eventual consistency like you'll get operational transforms or CRDT. It's instant. Um, the next thing is actually a Bitcoin visualization, we're actually grabbing live data from uh, uh, the Bitcoin and, and, and displaying that. This one's much more interesting, talked about creation and modification. I'm going to click on that um, flamingo, and I'm going to drag him down. And the reason I'm doing that, the code co that controls this guy is right here. And remember, this is two separate uh, users, That's two browsers side by side in my case, but we're modifying this, and when we do that, we set the Flamingo to go backwards. We actually made a change to the code and that was a fully replicated event. This uh, globe is every single, almost every single uh, commercial flight in the air uh, at, at that moment. Uh, you can see Ukraine uh, uh, went past too fast, but basically Ukraine, there's no airplanes on top of it. And then this is a, a portal and uh, one user draw, walks into it. By the way, I invented portals many, many years ago. And what we're looking at 
is two different URLs, completely separated. They're basically iframes. You're looking from one end to the other. And, those, and that object is just another object. You can pick it up, but you also can walk through it. So Alan had this wonderful quote, the computer is an instrument whose music is ideas, which you think about it, it's just like, what? that's just so profound and so deep and also fits with this conversation a bit. But the augmented conversation is jazz, allowing us to explore these ideas together uh, and, and create something new every single time. So metaverse is a communication medium more than anything. And that's our goal, is to make that real. I'm open to questions. <laughs> Anything? And I'm around. And by the way, we have a booth. Um, at, uh, if you want to check it out, you can actually see all that working for real. All right? Yeah, it's better than that. I, can't, I couldn't do it here because they don't have internet access, so that was weird. All right? No, I, wanna, I always do a live demo, and I couldn't do it here. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. I'm sorry? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Maybe in this room. Thanks again, David. Thank you. Uh, we'll check out your booth. I'm excited to see the live demonstration. Again.